Hello, I'm the Clinical Support with SABO. This is part two of our online training series for electrical stimulation for the upper limb. So in this section, we're going to go through electrodes and parameters, or in other words, the settings on your electrical stimulation device. So beginning with electrodes, you'll have probably seen already that these come in a variety of shapes, different sizes, different materials, obviously different brands as well. It's important to remember that the electrodes will deliver the stimulation to whatever is underneath it. So you need to bear in mind the size and the shape of the electrode to match up with what you are trying to stimulate. So for example, if you're stimulating a larger muscle, like your quadricep muscle, you may want to consider a longer rectangular electrode. If you're maybe going for a very small muscle around the thumb, for example, you may want to go for a much smaller electrode, like a 1.25 inch. The ones in the picture on the left are two inch round. These are probably the most commonly used size for the upper limb, and you can also get two inch square as well. So before you stick the electrodes to the skin, you want to consider preparing the skin to get the best conductivity possible. So the skin needs to be really clean and really dry. And when we talk about clean, we mean no moisturizer, no cream, no lotions. Bear in mind that you maybe don't apply a specific moisturizing cream, but a shower gel or a soap might have moisturizer in it. We want to make sure that obviously there's no dirt or dead skin as well, because anything like that will impede the stimulation going through to the muscle. So the gold standard of cleaning skin and preparing it is an alcohol wipe, which will really clean and dry the skin. Otherwise, use water, give it a good wipe and make sure it's dry before sticking the electrode on. If you have a lot of hair where you're going to stick the electrode, this means there's another layer for the stimulation to go through, which isn't, uh, makes it less effective. It also means when you remove that electrode, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you're then left with lots of hair stuck to the electrode, which will prevent it sticking well the next time. So what you want to use is either beard trimmers or a pair of scissors to clip the hair. Don't go straight for a razor, when you use a razor, particularly if it's a dry shave, you'll cause tiny micro abrasions, which you maybe can't see. And then when the stimulation goes through this, it will be quite harsh and uncomfortable. When you then stick in the electrodes onto the skin, just make sure that there are no wrinkles in it and it's smoothed down flat. You don't want edges peeling up. That's usually a sign that the electrode is coming to the end of its life is then the stimulation is concentrated more harshly through the smaller area that is stuck to the skin. If you do have sensitive skin, you might want to consider using slightly thicker gel on the electrodes. So you can get electrodes under the banner of hypoallergenic, but really you're looking for a slightly uh, thicker layer of gel. These are usually a little bit more expensive, but they are worth it if you have um, reactions or discomfort with standard electrodes. They potentially have a longer lifespan because of the thicker gel as well. So even though they may be a little bit more expensive, maybe more cost um, saving over the longer term. So for placement over the skin, you want to either place it over the muscle belly or the motor point. So this is where the nerve enters the muscle. If you can find the motor point, this means that you don't have to put quite as much stimulation in to get the muscle contraction. And it's therefore more of a comfortable stimulation, but certainly the easiest point is to find a muscle belly if you're not sure. As a rough guide only, think about keeping three centimeters or a three finger gap between the electrodes. The further the way they are spaced from each other, um, the better disbursement of stimulation. You don't want to place electrodes over the carotid sinus, anywhere over the front of the neck, across the chest. So that means having an electrode, your first electrode on one side and then your second electrode on the other side and the same across the neck. You don't want to have one on the left side and then one on the right because the stimulation is then going to pass between the two. If you have open wounds or inflamed skin or red skin for whatever uh, medical reason, 
you don't want to place the electrode over those areas either as it will irritate them. So knowing where to place the electrodes um, can be a little bit difficult. Everybody anatomically is slightly different. Um, you may have a guide within the manual and certainly we place a, a guide within our Stabo Stim 1, for example. There are also useful online resources. These two are good um, suggestions, but it's not an exhaustive list. So we have done an upper limb placement guide on our Sabo UK YouTube channel. Um, another really good resource is Axel Guard, who are an electrode manufacturer um, to go through the different muscles and movements that you might be looking at. Just remember the placement on the videos, use that as a starting point, but you may need to adjust depending on uh, the muscle bolt that you have um, and the orientation of your muscles as well. So to try and look after your electrodes and make them last as long as possible, when you peel the electrodes off your skin, don't peel it off using the little wire attachment. Carefully peel from the corners of the electrode as this could damage the electrodes. Try and keep them as clean as possible. So as soon as they're removed from your skin, give them a small dab of water just to remove any debris or skin and then put them back onto the plastic backing that, they, that you got them in. So putting that dab of water also keeps them hydrated, which is really important. And then place them on the on side of the plastic backing. So whichever type of electrode you use, it will always have an on side that you can place it back on. And it's a good habit to get into to put it back in the sealable bag as well. Electrodes don't like drying out. That's when they start to lose their lifespan. So try and keep them hydrated within reason as much as possible. They don't like extreme heat either. So don't put them near hot sunny windows or on your radiator. Also, don't put them in fridges or freezers to keep them cool. When you are, if you do need to clean the electrodes, don't use any solution such as soap or alcohol, just use plain water. And obviously don't do a really abrasive scrub. Scrub, you're really doing a light, gentle um, rub. So that concludes our section on electrodes. This next section is all about parameters and settings for your electrical stimulation device. The majority of devices out there will have a number of preset programs on them. These have been created by the manufacturers to cover pretty much most functions that you want to use the device for. So as a starting point, I would suggest that you utilize those preset programs first. However, if you want to know the theory and the basis of how those programs are made up and why you may want to look at adjustments, we're going to go through each of the individual parameters that can be adjusted. So these are frequency, pulse duration, which is sometimes termed pulse width, the amplitude and the duty cycle. And the duty cycle comprises the time the stimulation is on, the rest time and the ramp up and ramp down. And I'll explain what those are. So this analogy or, or picture explains hopefully in a very simple way what each of those parameters does when the stimulation is on. So if you imagine a tap being turned on and water flowing out of it, the frequency is how often that tap is turned on and off. The pulse duration is when the tap is on, how long is the tap on for? And then the amplitude is how fast the water is flowing. So thinking about frequency, this is the number of electrical pulses that are delivered per second when the stimulation is on. And it's measured in Hertz, which is abbreviated to HZ. So the user may not feel the electrical pulses. They'll most likely with a muscle contraction feel a continuous stimulation, but it's actually comprised of lots of um, short electrical pulses. Within the low frequency range, so about one to 10 Hertz, you will actually feel more of a twitch stimulation as opposed to a sustained muscle contraction. And this typically is used for sensory stimulation or pain relief. 
And in particular for sensory stimulation, it's actually more likely to work on proprioception. So that's our body's awareness of where a limb is in space. In the moderate frequency range, so about 20 to 50 hertz, sometimes up to 60 hertz, this will produce a sustained muscle contraction. And this is the most commonly used range for strengthening post-neurological injury. So the programs that are preset on your stimulation device will usually have a frequency somewhere within this range. When you go above this range to a high frequency, you will get a stronger muscle contraction, but it may not be as comfortable and you may um, fatigue, the muscles may fatigue more quickly. So it's not always um, necessarily the optimum to go to. When you go above 100 hertz, you get back into sensory stimulation again and in specifically sensory awareness. So if there is a sensory stimulation program preset, it may have a frequency of 100 hertz or around about there. So in summary, you maybe want to be the lower end of that range of 20 to 35 uh, hertz frequency for a more comfortable muscle contraction that won't fatigue too quickly. If you can tolerate it and you're trying to work on building strength, you may want to start increasing that frequency. The next parameter that can be adjusted is pulse duration. So when the stimulation is on and you have one of those tiny pulses, it's how long that pulse is on. And it can be measured in either milliseconds or microseconds. So that's a thousandth of a second or a millionth of a second. So a short pulse duration is usually around 50 to 100 microseconds. By going for a shorter pulse duration, it's easier to stimulate a muscle contraction. It triggers the muscle fibers that are easier to contract. But it does mean that fatigue is more likely to happen more quickly. It is slightly more comfortable as well. So that's another plus point for a short pulse duration. The other end of the scale, a longer pulse duration, you will get a stronger or more forceful contraction, but it may not be quite as comfortable for some users. There is also a chance that you may get some overflow into unwanted uh, surrounding muscles. So if you're stimulating, particularly around smaller muscles around the hand or the wrist, you may not just get the muscle that you want to stimulate, but the muscles around it. So typically you will see a pulse duration range for muscle strengthening post neurological injury of around about 250 to 300 microseconds. So the reason why you may want to adjust within that range is you might want to move to the higher end of the range for a stronger contraction if you can tolerate it. However, if it is too uncomfortable or you start to see some overflow, so you see muscles working that you don't want to see working, then you may want to reduce that pulse duration down. Just be aware with the overflow. Don't get that confused if you have your, remember if you get the electrodes in the wrong place and they're not over the desired muscle, you may get stimulation of muscles that you don't want. So just double check with your electrode placement as well. Then amplitude is the measure of the strength of the stimulation. So it's sometimes referred to as the current. It's measured in milliamps, which is abbreviated to a little m and a capital A. And this is the parameter that you will adjust once the program is started. You turn this up and it increases that flow of water, if you think of the tap analogy or the muscle stimulation. So if you've got the other parameters correct or in a, a good range, it means that you can turn this up to get the desired muscle contraction without discomfort, without fatigue. So it always starts at zero. And when you, and that's what you're going to turn up. And when you see the increments, it's milliamps. When the program stops and you maybe start the program or move to a different program, it will always start at zero again. 
And then the duty cycle is the total time um, that is comprised of the on time. So that's when the muscle is being stimulated. You usually will have a ramp up and a ramp down time. So the ramp up just means that there's a gradual increase in the stimulation to make it more comfortable as it comes on. So it's not a sudden uh, stimulation. Often that's about one to two seconds and that's counted within the on time, within the duty cycle. And then again, when the stimulation is off during the rest period, you will often get a ramp down again, typically about one to two seconds. So that is gradually decreasing the stimulation. So the reason you maybe want to extend that ramp up period is if you really want to graduate the person getting used to the stimulation, if they may be unsure or sensitive to it, you may want to shorten it or actually take it away altogether if they're doing a functional task and they really want that stimulation to come on quite quickly when they're going as a reward to going to um, complete the task. When you're thinking of ratios of the stimulation on and off time, that can be dependent on the user, whether you're wanting short, sharp bursts, so that enables more high repetitions, or you're working maybe more on endurance and you're looking for a longer contraction time. Factor in that, also factor in fatigue as well and how much of a rest period you need between each contraction. So think somewhere in a ratio of about one to five for the on-off time as helping reduce muscle fatigue. And it may be that you can adjust that as you tolerate it more, you become more, uh, you become stronger and have better endurance. So to go into more depth, some suggested further reading, I've just listed a few articles here um, that are really, really uh, good resources for all the material that we've covered, and I would highly recommend them. And I will put links in the comments section on the, this YouTube video on how to access them. Thank you for watching part two.